Thank you everyone for being here at the November monthly meeting of the Fusion Party. Um, I'm signing in from Gadigal land, part of the Eora Nation, and I pay my respects to Gadigal elders past and present. We're here in Sydney uh, trying to do a real life meetup to cook in with the online meetup. Uh, it's just me and Andrea Finno here at the moment. And that is all right. Uh, we'll do this um, some more times if people want to um, get into real life meetings like we used to do in the before times. Uh, my name's Andrea Leong, and I used to run these meetings in my capacity as comms uh, chair. And I guess I kind of still am, but I'm uh, the secretary now. So perhaps I'm running it in my capacity as secretary. Uh, we had our AGM on the 6th of November, and uh, there we elected or announced the results of our committee elections. So um, huge thanks to our departing and founding um, committee members, uh, Miles, um, outgoing national campaigns coordinator, uh, Roger, outgoing secretary, who also stepped into the role of president um, partway through the year, and outgoing registered officer, Cami Cordner-Hunt. We uh, moved into our second year with new president, Saha Khalili, new national campaigns coordinator, Luke James, Ongoing Treasurer Michael Morosky. Um, I've moved into the Secretary role and we have Owen, our new Registered Officer. So thank you to, um, to everyone who is departing and everyone who contested um, for an election and everyone who took part in those committee elections. Uh, Saha, would you like to say a few words? Yes, thanks. Um, I hope the wind isn't coming through. Uh, I just wanted to say thank you. Um, I'm it's a privilege for me to be the president. Um, the reason why I went for it is because I have a very clear vision um, for the future of Fusion that I'd really like to implement. And that's what I'm working on with the team. Um, what I want to lay out is um, we will let you know, I guess, more frequently and more transparently um, how we are developing policies. And we will make a very clear um, opportunities for uh, people from the party to contribute um, and that's where we'll refine policies um, and the content of the policies and then we'll have events where we will showcase the policies and then get member feedback so um, going forward we've had to really you know settle it, it, there was a lot of work behind the scenes um, with the merger and, and thank you for the um, originating exec because they really laid the, the groundwork there but now that the dust has settled from the Fed election and the big election, we have some time to focus on where we want to go in the long term. So uh, more comms to come. Awesome. Thank you, Saha. And you can find actually we've updated our website um, at our party um, under the about section of our website. So we used to um, have a little blurb there about the formation of the party. And now that's starting to evolve and that page will continue to evolve as we uh, put into words our um, our direction. Uh, so some party updates. Um, we've got a, um, a party name review going on um, at the moment. We've started the process calling for submissions for possible um, names other than Fusion for the party. And I'll talk about that in a second. Um, and we'll have our membership update tonight. Usually we would have a finance update, um, but uh, Michael Morosky has uh, let me know that that won't uh, be possible tonight, unfortunately, so that's deferred, but he has assured me that the financial state of the party is basically the same as it was last month. Uh, no surprises. Um, I'll speak briefly about the working groups that are the, the sort of pillars of our operation at the moment, and then we'll have our Victorian election campaign wrap up. So on the topic of the party name review, um, we've been calling for submissions for alternate names um, since we advertised the annual general meeting and submissions are closing tonight um, at midnight local time, um, after which a working group will be convened to consider all of the submissions and they'll be meeting on the 11th of December, it's a Sunday afternoon, um, and that is open to all members. Uh, Peter Johnson will be running that 
group. Sorry, Peter, I didn't have you on the front of the um, <laughs> on the front slide. Our convener, Peter. Sorry, I don't have a, a photo to share of you. Um, that was an omission, but that's right. Good, if, if that's useful. Yes, please. Yeah, good day all. Hi. Um, so we've had a wonderful range of submissions. I think there's actually over 30. I haven't checked the last count, but a good number and a good, I think, 10 or so in the last few days. So there's a bounty of ideas of how we um, try and catchphrase our vision, our party to the electorate that are going to be under uh, some sort of objective scrutiny as much as possible. Just so everyone knows, so our submissions close this, this evening. So if you have any final ideas, please submit those. Um, effectively, um, the process is we've identified some criteria to try and objectify our assessment and the drivers for recognition to the electorate. And um, while they've been approved by the executive as criteria, I'll try and explain a little bit uh, to introduce the nature of those criteria. And then we'll just have a very simple scoring system against each suggested name uh, for those that participate on how to actually score the criteria from your personal opinion. Um, and I think the one thing that we will do is if you've nominated a name, we'll ask you to abstain from that choice for obvious reasons. The reason is effectively that we're trying to put ourselves in the shoes of the electorate and to see how the names appeal to those that don't have an emotional connection to them, you know? Uh, it'll be a two-hour session. If you've submitted a name, you'll be invited to it, and all members are invited as well. Uh, the outcome is there'll be a scoring system on the most preferable names, and that'll go to the executive to uh, choose how they choose to implement it or what they choose to do with this process. Um, invite everyone along. It'll be a bit of fun. It won't be too sort of serious, and we'll try and get it all done in two hours. Thanks. Cool. Thank you, Peter. Any questions about that? If not, we'll um, just move on to the member um, update. Um, now, we're up um, 32 members since last month. We've got a total of um, 1,816 members on the books. Now, this is uh, due to an import of 80 climate change justice members. Um, just around the time of the AGM notification. Um, so that has obviously bumped up numbers in the ACT, given that that is um, where climate change justice is largely based. And um, we've been showing these graphs of um, membership by branch since we first started doing these monthly meetings, but I would like to start focusing instead on members by state. Um, Oh, but also um, here's something new that we haven't shown before, which is the members by branch over time. Um, and that um, explains the climate change justice um, increases is the reason for our increase in members. There's been some drop off in the pirates who are very diligent with the uh, an annual renewal process. Um, so some members have chosen not to renew in the last four months. Um, and it's pretty stable for the other branches and a slow and steady increase in fusion um, unaligned non-branch members. Um, so I realize I'm showing probably the same data in a few different ways. Uh, this is new signups, whereas the previous graphs were total members. Um, so again, just showing the, the increase that we get before an election in the lead up to our um, May federal election. There's this big block of blue science members in July, and that was a um, part of the membership drive we did for the Victorian campaign. And then in October, that import of climate change justice members as mentioned. So that's where our new members are coming from. And as I said, I'd like to focus going forward on membership numbers by state, since that's what's gonna let us um, have a go at registering for state elections. Might try to get those numbers over time as well. Right. And as mentioned, the um, we don't have a finance report tonight. So moving on, um, I just quickly wanted to mention the working groups again, because we're always, you know, the one thing that we're not short of is 
great ideas. We've got a lot of great ideas flying around um, on the Discord chat and elsewhere. What we're short on is people to put those into action. And I know this is difficult because we are a fully volunteer organisation. Uh, we are trying to break down the tasks and roles that need to be filled into uh, bite-sized chunks for those volunteers who might be able to come in and do some work and then um, you know not not be able to have a sustained commitment but if you can um, have a sustained and ongoing commitment there are working groups that need membership uh, I think engagement communications and campaigns have uh, kind of a membership of one and policy has a membership of zero at the moment so all those functions are uh, delegated to the executive but we'd like to have uh, these sort of autonomous working groups that take care of a lot of day-to-day -day operations so there's engagement which involves uh, personal engagement with our members um, and also engagement with external organizations um so how does that sound like a pretty reasonable yeah um so i'm the chair of engagement at the moment and um, i We'll have to sit down and think of a long term strategy to get more people involved. We would always love to have people involved, but I, I understand if, if people don't know what I want, it's hard for them to volunteer. So stay tuned. Yeah, same communications of which I'm the chair. So all the graphics and writing and videos that we put out, um, yeah, I need to make clear what it is like how we run things and what it is that we need to do um, and uh, campaigns obviously is election campaigns but also non-election campaigns um, I don't know if Miles you've just got um, if someone was interested in joining the campaigns team is there anything off the top of your head that you can say we needed the most of in terms of volunteer uh, hours so to give an idea of some of the key roles that we need, we need people working engagement as one of the um, one of the core volunteer roles. And so engagement is primarily remote engagement. So um, a lot of the work there is phone banking and SMS banking, but also working on things like emails, member management, and um, helping out with event design and uh, event management. We also have a another very important thing is working on communications and so part of that is internal member communications so there's a lot of overlap with engagement there but also doing social media work and uh, and there's a little bit of overlap with policy as well in preparing things like press releases and submissions so most of the work for comms is actually on the social media side where you're preparing content and um, writing short snippets getting photos and all that kind of stuff Obviously, we need physical volunteers as well on the ground, but the need for physical volunteers is very, very specific and narrow. And although when we do need those physical volunteers, we tend to need as many as possible. Thanks, Miles. And yeah, there's obviously crossover between the four uh, groups, and that is that just makes it more important uh, that the roles and um, tasks are defined. And policy, as I mentioned, has a is has a population of zero at the moment. We've got uh, terms of reference for a policy committee um, and we need a convener for that. Uh, ideally, uh, a few standing members, I think, that can like, dispassionately look at the policy proposals that we get in and people can um, sort of move in and out of the policy working group to formulate the, the bulk of policies as, uh, as things come up. There's so many things so many ways that we can find to do make good use of your skills. Yeah, can I just add policy? Because we have so much enthusiastic um, chat on the Discord, and I think what we need to do is to focus that energy into um, an activity that we can use for long term infusion. We have plenty of experts uh, and specialists in our party, so let's drive that information and passion into policy content. And I'd see the um, policy chair as being someone who um, would coordinate events for the members to review the content and provide feedback and approve them eventually. 
because we, we do know there are some contentious topics still out there uh, and we really need engagement with our members to understand what the policy is about and to get on board or provide that feedback. Thanks. Any other questions or comments? Well, we'll move on to our Victorian election wrap up with Miles. Thanks. So we had four fusion members running as independents in the recent state election campaign, which actually finished on, which was on Saturday. It was the big day. And uh, we put out a lot of comms. So most of you will be familiar with these members here. or would have heard about them through some of the comms we talked about. And we have two of them here as well tonight to give a little retrospective later. So I am currently eight pages and 3,000 words into my own reflection of how the election went. So this is a little snapshot of some of the analysis I've been doing. The uh, There was six campaign goals, or seven campaign goals, four of which were SMART goals. And so one of the key things about SMART goals is they are measurable or quantifiable. So you can see some hard numbers here. Now, just to briefly quote from my reflection, the uh, rationale for the 50 volunteer count was that in the federal election, we had approximately 30 Victorian volunteers. So that number has been more or less recreated there. The 25% member growth target was just an arbitrary target. So I'm not so worried about missing either of those. And in fact, um, getting 30 volunteers as well as I, I've covered more, more detail in my reflection, there was a lot of people we didn't manage to activate through the engagement campaign. So that volunteer count could have been quite higher, uh, but if we'd had more people on the phones, basically. Uh, now the vote count there, we reached approximately half of what other Vic Minor parties were getting in the districts compared. And I think, um, so I, I think that goal was achieved that we were um, approximately the same results as other Victorian minor parties, given that the parties we were campaigning against did have established brands and for the most part had more volunteers. And I will note in one specific instance, uh, we did actually beat one of the minor parties. And so Andrea Otto uh, achieved more primary, more first preference votes compared to the Animal Justice Party in her electorate of Murray Plains district. And um, I've, so I've covered these in much more detail oh, in my reflection and just regarding the engagement contacts as well. We contacted about 325 people, which is a pretty monster effort. Um, 300 was the target there because that was approximately the what we hit during the federal election number of people we contacted. So these goals were not smart, which is to say they were not measurable and arguably were very difficult not to achieve. So, uh, but but I did put them in as lower priority goals because I considered they were important things to consider and to be aware of, and um, and would be good to to have that consideration in our campaign planning. So obviously brand awareness, boom. Um, that one was uh, we did not get as much progress as I was hoping, mainly because we didn't get state registration. So um, so naturally there was a limit to how much promotion we could do of the fusion brand, but, um, there was some indirect promotion we managed to do. So that wasn't a total write-off now campaigning experience. I wrote extensive campaign documentation at the start of the campaign, which was very thoroughly battle tested. And, uh, in my review, I'm going through all of the planning and, um, and seeing how all that all that planning turned out in experience. Now, the last one, theory of change. This one's a little bit more esoteric and relates more to how we link our principles and values and vision, how we link that back to what we're actually doing when we campaign. Now, I specifically didn't write a theory of change in the planning documentation at the start of the campaign because it is a massive thing to, to fully lay out. However, I did lay down some ideas, which I thought could be a precursor for developing a theory of change. And so as part of my reflection, I'm revisiting those ideas and uh, making some progress towards a theory of change, but again, not writing a comprehensive theory of change. Um, to briefly summarize, um, the uh, a one, one possible goal is to get some candidates elected who can then act as a balance of power. And then we'll have little smaller goals along the way. 
so just to cover the financial side, the approximate expenditure was $4,000. Uh, the candidates were all handling their own independent returns. However, those are the numbers that I have at this stage. The party expenditure was $500 for our registration application. And uh, obviously that that failed, but it was worth it, worth it to make the expense and to learn so much about the registration attempt as everything, obviously everything we learned in this Victorian attempt will be useful, very useful for all other states as well. So we've got that, that body of experience now. Uh, about $210 was spent on communications during the registration attempt. Uh, the failure to achieve registration caused a lot of chaos. Um, the A lot of the timeline and planning had to get shuffled around. Um, some A lot of deadli deadlines and milestones were missed. We didn't, we, well, we couldn't really, we couldn't seek party donations. Um, we could, but it was complicated. So in the end, we had no party donations there. And and because the, the budget didn't line up with the timelines as well, in the end, we didn't ask for donations from the National Party to the candidates, although that was one thing we considered. So I'll ask now the candidates that we have in chat to speak a little bit about how the campaign from went from their perspective. Uh, Andrea Otto, would you like to go first? Yeah, thanks, Miles, for uh, inviting me along. Um, Elections in regional Australia or regional Victoria are a lot of fun. Um, there's a real sense of camaraderie. You get to know uh, all the people who are handing out for you, you know, and around you. Uh, and it's it's uh, there's a lot of laughs. Um, so you know, it's uh, it's good fun. So in the federal election, I had a result of 07 percent. Um, which was pretty disappointing um, when I when I when I saw that, uh, but um, I've managed to build on that, and and in this state election, I've increased that to two and a half percent. I attribute that to a a, a few things. Um, pre polling is really important, so uh, you have to be there uh, for most of the time. Uh, in the federal election, we had a lot of pre-polls. Uh, they were everywhere. In the state election, there was only two, so that made uh, that made this uh, a bit a bit easier uh, to only have to cover two. I was only covering one. Uh, most of my volleys worked, so uh, or weren't in the areas where the pre-polling was. So that you know, but um, that that was a big part of the reason why I uh, increased my percentage, um, and um, and volleys are important. They make a huge difference. Um, my best um, site was Kahuna. Um, I'm reasonably well known in Kahuna, but it was also the site that I had people handing out at, um, and I I was handing out in Kyabram which is um, maybe an hour and a half from where I live. Um, and that had the most thro throughput. So it's important to understand um, when you're doing elections, you know, we're picking the right places uh, to have volunteers and making sure that uh, some of those places you're seen in. Uh, wasn't without mistakes. I misunderstood the rules around the how to vote card. Um, I got a how to vote card that was no problems, but I didn't actually know that I could put election material on the back because the rules said no election material in the nine, the four, 400 or 600 metre zone. I think it was 600 metre zone. Um, anyway, so I was the only candidate there who was having to give a spiel to every single person <laughs> um, there because it wasn't on the back of my card. So uh, that was just me and the election manager misinterpreting the rules. Uh, whereas, you know, all the other guys had uh, had a party machine behind them that was able to uh, do that work for them and do it better than I did. Um, all in all, uh, I'm really happy with, uh, with my result. I, you know, I think when we look at, at dollars spent, and, and I, it'll be under 1500 for me, um, I've worked out it'll probably be between 
a dollar fifty and two dollars a vote, but the amount of coverage I got and the amount of people that I spoke to around really important things like, you know, how tree hollows happen and uh, concerns around river health and climate and all that other stuff. Uh, it's, it's cheap advertising, you know, it's a cheap way to get a message out. So um, if you're even, even, you know, vaguely interested, um, go and volunteer at the next election uh, and find out what it's like to hand out because that's a lot of fun talking to people and, uh, and maybe consider running in your own electorate. And uh, just to add that to that point about Kahuna, there was a, a massive bump in votes there for Andrew Otto in the town of Kahuna. And um, some of our early, our early ideas about why that is is because she's a pretty famous local figure there. I don't know about that. You built on the Fed election, so only go up. Yeah, that's right. And that's the aim, isn't it? We just, um, and you learn every election, you learn more and, uh, and you, you make less mistakes. Yeah, so it's, um, it's good fun. As you'd know, Saha. <laughs> okay, I'll uh, invite Simon Nieslaw to speak next and, um, and we'll take some questions later if there's time at the end. Yeah, thank you, Miles. Uh, yeah, so my, my experience running as independent candidate, um, I can definitely echo a lot of what Angia says. It does give you a lot of, ex it is cheap exposure. You just um, pay your $350 fee and then suddenly you, you, your your voice is, is more important to, to get messages out. Um, I had many uh, conversations with, um, you know, people, members of the public um, other parties, other candidates. Uh, to, for me, I'm, I'm very happy with the result, even though it's not a lot of votes. It, to me, it wasn't about winning. Uh, it, to me, this was just the start of a, a long-term election and, and activism campaign to, to get my, my name out there um, so that I can advocate for, for, for things. Um, look, look, I, it was a very cutting edge campaign too. So I um, tried to do things a little bit differently um, came up with new ideas, ideas that uh, haven't been discussed uh, in the general discourse of politics before. So uh, it's it's good. And also also another thing which I was doing was um, I was I was making a lot of arguments about particularly around climate change, but also from an economic perspective um, to to see uh, how how difficult or easy it would be to get conservatives on board um, if, with the idea that if we can get left and right together on some of these issues, that is uh, something that would cause less friction in, in getting change happening and um, could, could potentially be something to come back to fusion about as a way to get broader appeal that, and, and the differentiation between the Greens. Um, that was very uh, positive so far um, with, with the conversations I've had. I've, had a lot of fruitful conversations with conservatives to, to bring them on side and soon um, we'll get some more uh, results from the VEC who are still counting the votes, but there will be what's called a preference distribution happening where we'll get to see, uh, quite luckily because I came last, um, we'll see who put which party second. So we'll get a bit of data out of that to see you know how, how many people may have put Liberal Party second after me, and then try and try and try and see if there's any any viable strategies there to to get broad appeal. Um, so I'm I'm very excited about that. Um, so yeah, definitely definitely happy achieved all my uh, objectives out of this. Uh, another one being that I want to encourage other people to to want to run because we need just everyday honest people to run for politics. Uh, it isn't something that should just be left to others. And I hope that this would uh, would motivate other people to run in, in future elections. And um, a few a few people uh, say that they, you know, sort of um, respect respect um, that I ran. Um, so, and I've been telling a lot of people for a long time, oh, you should run, you should run. So for me, uh, it would make me hypocritical to, to not run uh, if I'm telling everyone else to. So uh, definitely, if anyone is considering it, um, it is it is a 
it is an important job. Uh, it's good. Um, it's, a, it's a civic duty to to be active in politics, and you know we need we need the good guys to to balance out the bad guys, basically. Yeah, I just want to say I had a very approachable campaign. I think you were very down to earth. Um, even just your leaflet and your poster. It was, you know, at least a, a point of that uh, you were there for community consultation and transparency, which, you know, I think any side of politics will appreciate. So good work. Yeah, definitely. There was, there was a balance to be struck with with the ideas that I was bringing to the electorate. And I think I came up with a good balance of ideas. Um, in the end, um, I, I very I picked on three main points. First one being climate emergency, I felt it was very important to put that number one due to the seriousness of it. Um, but I, as part of that, I also says, um, put, put forward a solution rather than just say, oh, it's a climate emergency. We'll say it's a climate emergency. And the solution is we, we need to invest more into renewables and bring left to right together on the issue by focusing on the investment side of things as well. Um, because obviously we, we will need a lot of renewables built to, to, to pull us out rather than just talk about it. Um, my, sec my second point was the community consultation. Um, it, was, it was a bit hard to, to, to judge how things were going in Victoria after um, such uh, long lockdowns, but in, in the end, I think most Victorians seem to have forgiven uh, Daniel Andrews for what happened, um, but I still made it a point that, um, and, and without knowing that at the time either, um, I still made a point that we should be more involved with these decision makings and not just with lockdowns, just with any any matter at all. So, you know, there's been a few surprise speed limit changes in the area. That's just an example of how things can change without the community being part of it. And um, the third one was uh, just a bit more of a, of a futuristic vision about e-bikes and protected bike lanes um, and, and how we could transform, um, transform transport, uh, which also feeds back into um, climate change as, as well as being more energy efficient way of, of getting around and even going back to community consultation that also feeds back into um, climate uh, climate action as well because you know I feel like um, we need everyone to come together on that to, to get climate action done uh, so community consultation is part of it um, and, and also throughout the campaign you know there was there were things that went well and things that didn't go so well, so um, you know, I, I am you know working on on iterating through those th things, and there'll be a report uh, of, for myself coming back to Fusion as well, so that we can we can learn from my mistakes, and and uh, and and see what we can do better next time. I, I would really like to see um, Fusion keep members engaged, um, not just when there's an election coming up, but just on an ongoing basis. There's plenty of of potential campaigns to do in between elections. It doesn't have to be an electoral campaign, but there's many you know, social issues that could, that could be advocated on, uh, or even just do fun stuff. Uh, you know, main, main point is, is, to, is to keep things rolling so that um, when the time comes that we actually do need members to help and everyone's ready to go rather than having to recruit again every time there's an election on. So, and I'm really, really keen to see um, lo local branches in, in each state um, get up and running as well. Like we, we're all working digitally and, and I think that's great. We share a lot of ideas um, around the country, even within this, you know, you know for what's the same state, I'm learning a lot from Andrea and Cami. Um, hopefully a few things rub off from me to them as well, because we're, you know, on complete opposite sides of the state. Things are a little bit different between us. Um, so I'm learning learning a lot. Um, also, their background in, in Vote Planet, I was with the Pirates. You know, there's a, there's, a, there's a good exchange of ideas within the party, thanks to the internet. So really, really great stuff there. But unfortunately, when it comes to a natural election, things are fought on geographic lines. So we, we, we need to keep things moving uh, in, in geographic areas as well. Thanks a lot, Simon. And we'll get uh, Cami to speak next. Yeah, so I, I, it seems to me when I put on my video, I'm, I'm losing um, bandwidth, so I'm sorry about that. Um, okay, yeah, look, uh, thank you, um, Simon and Andrea, for those uh, thoughts and very similar to my experiences. And yes, I gather, 
learned a great deal from both of you, got courage from both of you. Um, and thank you, Miles, for ringing, doing all that ringing around and your incredible support uh, in kind and just, you know, just, you know, being like a coach. They're always there to turn to. Thank you for that. That was an incredible feeling. Um, unfortunately, like I, I had two uh, candidate forums before nominations even closed and they went really, really well. So that really encouraged me to nominate as an independent um, in my electorate, which otherwise I was probably not really going to do. But um, nominations closed on the Friday and then pre-polling started on the Monday. So there was, um, and there was an incredible uh, mandate to be uh, at pre-polling the whole time as Andrea found out. Um, so it was extremely hard to run a campaign and be at pre-polling. But with Miles' help, we found, did find some people to take over for me, from me from time to time and help out. Certainly at the Mansfield booth, never found anyone in the uh, launching place area. Um, I just didn't have enough of a profile or, and I hadn't had enough time to pull together um, any kind of uh, candidate presence because as you may all be aware, I was 100% committed to standing for the Senate with the upper house, which is called the Legislative Council um, for fusion. So uh, when we didn't get across the line, which wasn't that much longer, really, I think it was something like 13, no, it would have been 12 days, I think, before um, nominations closed. And um, so, yeah. So it was a bit of a shoestring to start a campaign on, but I have to say, um, I think it was Simon who, who said it, uh, you pay $350 and all of a sudden everyone thinks, everyone wants to hear from you. So you get invited to candidate forums, um, you get invited to contribute to newspapers. Um, I was even invited onto radio and um, it was an incredible opportunity to stand on one's soapbox and get one's message out there, which which Adrian has always said, but I've always wanted to go for the upper house and try and get in. And Adrian said, oh, it's, you can be so effective in your local electorate. And so I, I really know what he was saying now. It was it just made such a huge difference. I didn't have to run around trying to be noticed. I was already noticed just by nominating, whereas when you're standing for the Senate, you're actually an anonymous tadpole in a pond full of hundreds of other anonymous tadpoles. So um, I think from that point of view, it went well. Um, it would have been great to have had a couple of months to build a team, build a plan and do all of that instead of just jumping in and voila, here we are pre-polling and trying to campaign at the same time. <laughs> yeah, good oh. on you, Cammy. Always liked your campaign hustle. <laughs> um, there was one thing though, strangely enough, the Greens contacted me on the Sunday um, to say thank you because I put the Greens second and they put me second. That, that wasn't a plan, it just happened. I was always going to put the Greens second because there wasn't really anyone else I would have put second. Um, but they had definitely not planned to put me second because I was a completely unknown quantity. But fortunately, because we had those candidate forums before nominations closed, they by then they well and truly knew who I was and they put me second. So um, I did get a very low vote, which was very disappointing. But I can't help thinking that people were tossing up between voting for me or Greens and then saw that I was second on the Greens card. So I thought, oh, that's probably, that'll do. Because the, and because Greens contacted me to thank me for co-running with them and boosting their vote. Uh, I think they said 5%. And if they were going to, if they're going to attribute that to me or in part to me, then I'm very happy. <laughs> nice. Well, that sucks, but good work. You were noticed at least. They'll remember you for next time. Thank you. <laughs> one, one of the things we learned about Cammy's electorate, which was uh, very interesting and um, quite confusing as well, was that uh, even though it's one district, the Low House District of Eildon, it is in fact two demographics of people who live in Eildon, and they're very neatly. There's a very neat geographic split where everyone from about Mansfield North is old logging country in the. Uh, foothills of the Yarra Ranges and so it's fairly conservative strong nationals vote but then you go south of Lake Eildon you get to um the, the the bottom of the district is actually adjacent to Melbourne 
and the vote there is much more progressive. And so there's a lot of feedback from volunteers who were saying, who are up north and were really struggling with, with a more conservative voter base. But down south, there was a lot more support and a lot more friendliness towards Cami and Cami's campaign. Yes, it was. Actually, um, Miles, the spine of the Great Divide runs through the middle of the electorate. So we're, we're north of the divide here in Mansfield. And all of that um, fringe country in Melbourne is south of the divide. So it really is a discombobulated electorate, really. Hmm. Very, very interesting. But uh, learnings for learnings for next time. Hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting. We've always wondered where is the best place to station volunteers? Is it just in the place where you're going to see the most people? Is it where you're going to have um, a friendlier crowd? Um, but then again, there might be more or at least more interesting gains to be made in a hostile area um, if you can flip a few people who hadn't been thinking about you as a viable option and uh, you can maybe turn some of those people's opinions towards you um, but also for volunteers being in a friendly area is good for morale so there's so many considerations. That's true actually um, the Victorian Farmers Federation held a candidate forum in Mansfield the Animal Justice Party candidate got crucified not not in an unkind way um someone asked a question about how to handle a five million deer in the high country and cindy mcleish was who's the liberal candidate was you know just going on about rounding them up and shooting them and all this sort of thing and the animal justice party girl was getting increasingly distressed hearing these solutions so um one of the farmers asked her what she would do and and she said uh, well, we believe they're all sentient beings and that we're going to find a humane way to rehome them all. And um, and, and the room full of farmers, <laughs> they, they all just stared with their mouths open. They weren't being nasty. They were just being absolutely incredulous. But when I saw her the following week um, handing out down near Melbourne, uh, she said that um, she's so glad she went and it's her proudest moment that she got through it and she'll know how to handle that kind of situation better in the future. But anyway, the point of me telling you about this forum is that a number of people came up to me afterwards and told me that they thought my answers were better than anyone else. That's because um, the liberal answers were just rote and there's nothing convincing or genuine about them. And um, the Greens and and our Justice Party candidates were very intimidated by the environment. And I just stuck to the guns and stuck to the policies and, um, and it came out really strongly. So that was, that was a good experience for me too. Oh, Cammy, do you, um, sorry if this is too off topic, I'm curious what you said about the deer. I said, this is a massive problem, but nothing with, um, the department that is supposed to manage these sorts of things has been starved of funding for 30 years and gradually funding funding's been reduced and the department's been diminished and it needs um, a realignment of funds and it needs a whole group of experts in various fields to come together and actually debate how we're going to do this and and really um make a proper plan because at, at the moment absolutely nothing everyone's complaining about it but there's absolutely no plan on any table. I, I really like that, yeah. Oh, and, and also, yeah, look, just we really have to get experts in about this. We can't decide how we're going to do this. We actually have to ask people who know, who know how it should be done to get together and, and tell us how to do it. Yeah, I think people like to hear that. There's there's a real dearth of political participation. Yes. And I think it also helps maybe uh, your um, people's perceptions of you at a candidate forum when you have liberal um you know arrogance so far on one side of just uh doling out the lines that they've been fed versus some of the other smaller party mm -hmm. options who might have some views that are extreme according to the audience um and you come in and say let's listen to the experts and uh, fund our government departments yeah i do feel you're right andrea if you tell the audience that you want to listen to them that that's much better than telling the audience that you know what the answer is you know that you're going to do this we're coming up to eight o'clock um i'm pretty stoked to have heard from our three endorsed candidates um very cool to hear um andrea otto building on the 
the vote from federal um, election. Um, it's good to have that um, that information. And yeah, hearing about the Bentley campaign as well um, was also very interesting and informative. Andrea, can I just um, can I just say congratulations to both um, Kemi, Simon, and Adrian. It, it takes a lot of courage and um, and a lot of work to get through a political campaign, uh, as you'd also be aware. Um, and um, you know, Simon has just knocked it out of the ballpark as far as I'm concerned in terms of the numbers of votes he got, or the percentage, which I think might have been 1.8 or 9, uh, which, you know, that well outdid me in the federal election. So um, so well done, Simon, on, on just campaigning on really simple ideas that cuts through. Thank you, Andrew. And uh, I had Miles as my, as my eye in the sky as well, right? Um, doing a bit of um, and being, being the guy who was liaising with all my volunteers to, to bring everything together, making sure everyone was well looked after. I really, really, um, that, that day wouldn't have come together if it wasn't for us as help remotely from Brisbane. So, um, you know, huge gratitude to Miles' assistance. Um, so he, he, he definitely had a big part of it. I think he's just as much as part of it as, as the three of us who actually ran. Absolutely, Simon. And yes, Miles, thank you for everything. Um, it, was, uh, it was long and hard and arduous and you just showed up every week and, uh, <laughs> and made us all do a bit better. So thank you. Uh, and I just have to say one thing I will never forget for the rest of my life is driving down to the Hillsville <laughs> Candidate Forum, <laughs> not feeling particularly ready for it. And um, Miles on the phone throwing some questions at me so I could practice some answers and then we could quickly workshop what the answers could be. That was incredible. Thanks so much, Miles. <laughs> Look, I've I've offered I've offered about fifteen or twenty different candidates to do that, and uh, not all of them take it up. So, props to you, Cami, for you know having the humility. All of you guys for having the humility to say yes. You know, I'm happy to sit down and work on stuff together and workshop stuff because um, that's um, being able to work with people and listen to the experts is really a core thing, a core, a core value that we we talk about. For my part, I loved working with all all you guys as well. You're all lovely in different ways. Um, very highly motivated and experts in 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 your own different fields, and um, there there was some you know lovely photos of campaigning as well of um, seeing you guys out there and just wishing I could be out there as well handing out flyers. So thank you so much for standing up and uh, sticking it out to the end. It, to just to wrap up this topic as well, do we have any last quick questions for our candidates or myself? If um you guys have collected your learning. Um, from that would be really good to compile that um, just for the next campaigns that we have um, and better to do it sooner rather than later because there'll come a point where your brain just wants to push that to the side and you'll forget all the things that you learned. Yeah we'll be going into a, a debrief after this. Thank you Miles and thanks to all the candidates um, and then yeah as we are just after eight o'clock um, I'll just mention the uh, events that we have coming up the weekend just gone. We had some social meetups in four cities. Um, how did you find that in Victoria, uh, just coming off the back of the election? Yeah, well, uh, Simon and Owen um, had drinks after on the election night and then the Sunday we all met up in the afternoon, which is heaps of fun. The Sunday I was there, that was fun. Yeah, it was a good venue. Yeah. Yep. And, uh, we need to have more of these events. We need to have one in... Um, Adelaide as well and also outside the major cities so it just gets organized whenever anyone says hey let's have a social meetup so don't be shy um you know send something to uh secretary or anyone about getting a social meetup notice in the monthly newsletter if you would like to plan anything at any time um, and then coming up this time next week, we've got a special presentation by Dr. Jo Lackenby, who is a nuclear industry professional. She's worked at Opal, um, at Lucas Heights um, for oh, was 14 or 15 years, or maybe that was her time in the industry. Oh, sorry, Jo. Um, so Jo will be talking about not just energy, but also the research and medical applications of nuclear technologies.
And something I'm really interested to find out is how much the current ban that Australia has on nuclear power prevents us from doing practical experiments into nuclear fusion power. Australia has so many great scientists, including physicists, that go overseas to study and work on um, the practical applications of fusion that um, I'd, I'd love to see them retained in Australia and for Australia to be contributing to um, the next huge thing in energy generation. Well, I'll ask the question on the nuclear side. I saw some dialogue earlier in terms hmm. of our political party response. I wanted to just check the status of the nuclear policy that was drafted for the federal election. Yeah, so that hasn't changed. We haven't changed um, uh, that or any policy since federal election. So it's not in our main policy section, but in our policy FAQ um, that we um, have a position of wanting to repeal the ban, but not to have any government support for nuclear fission. Um, and that includes um, if there's a community that would like to look into small modular reactors, they should be able to have that right. Um, but we would also, I think we'd all agree that fusion would uh, consider that the, the rights of locals and traditional owners would have to be um, comfortable with whatever was, you know, if there was to be any um, any movement in the so private needs from re recent development in relation to uh, aircraft B fifty two bombers being uh, or building a runway up in Darwin, and therefore potentially we are no longer a nuclear free zone, which then extends the debate into the nuclear defence strategy and also our new uptake of nuclear-powered submarines. The blurb for this talk was about the energy research and medical applications of nuclear. Um, this yeah. is an informative and educational talk about. We've got areas in our policy that we could do to flesh out. So if there's like nuclear disarmament is not something we say anything on, but we definitely could. Um, if we've got people uh, interested and willing to write that policy and um, yeah. figure out how we pass that into the platform. Cool bananas. I'm happy. That's good. I just wanted to clarify. I'm you know, looking forward to a talk. Me too. Cool. Okay. Thanks, guys. Thank you very much, everyone.